I was very positive this morning talking about the New Zealand economy and I'll very quickly uh, recap that first for those of you who weren't here this morning. New Zealand economy, as the Minister mentioned, putting in a solid performance. A few small issues creeping in. Housing markets are smelling a little bit like 2007, but the Reserve Bank's uh, on top of that, at least they're hoping that they are. The LVR restrictions do appear to be working, but the question is for how long, given there are real demand supply imbalances in Auckland. Um, the uh, breaks, natural breaks uh, and unnatural breaks are due to come on, uh, the construction sector in particular, uh, labour shortages are acute, but also now um, banks fun bank funding starting to run a little bit short when you've got um, deposits going backwards and demand for borrowing going north in a big hurry, uh, and banks can't and won't go offshore and fill their boots with cheap offshore funding like they did. Uh, before the global financial crisis, which means essentially uh, that the price of borrowing has to go up, the reward for saving has to go up, um, and you're going to have to jump through more hoops to get bank funding for your projects. That said, you know, this economy's got a lot of momentum, the construction sector is a is a super tanker to turn. Uh, so there's plenty of good times to come, but it's just, it, it does suggest these, these things will find a natural top. And maybe that's not a bad thing because um, around this point of the business cycle, people can start to get a little over optimistic uh, about what constitutes a, a wise investment or project. Um, and the Reserve Bank's done cutting, not before time. This does not feel like an economy that needs record low interest rates. I mean, we're not in a great depression here. The rates are now lower than they were in the global financial financial crisis, uh, but that's because inflation's been so low and the dollar's been stubbornly high, um, but it's, it's not at all clear that um, the real economy is in need of that sort of stimulus, so it's probably just as well they're finished cutting, but they did leave their options open should something ugly happen offshore, which is the focus of this afternoon's presentation. So this, this chart is the New Zealand uh, share market over the election, and it pretty much sums up what happened in global markets. It was insane, and I suspect that algorithms uh, computers trading had quite a lot to do with the extreme moves. It was just crazy. So obviously the New Zealand market was open as the, as the news trickled in and people realised they'd got it wrong and that Trump was going to win. The market tanked um, and it was just panic stations all over the place. The Nikkei, the Japanese share market was down 5%. Uh, the yen went through the roof, gold went through the roof. Um, it, it was all pretty crazy. Um, and ANZ put out a piece saying, don't expect this one to bounce back as quickly as Brexit. And two hours later, I'd like to say that wasn't the ANZ New Zealand team who wrote that. <laughs> Thank goodness. It was a bit embarrassing. Uh, then it went vertical. It went completely crazy back up again. And since I did that chart, it's carried on you know, going up. Global markets are now, um, equity markets are solidly higher than they were. So we've gone from despair to euphoria inside 36 hours. Trump's now the best thing since sliced bread. And the spend up for the US economy is going to be fabulous. It's going to be so pro-business. None of that pesky regulation of banking and healthcare that was going to cause a few issues there. So party time. Uh, I think we can be pretty sure the volatility is going to continue and that markets are going to continue to swing about and change their minds about what Trump means. Uh, perhaps one of the most important things he does stand for, though, is a government spend up in a country that has already got a highly unsustainable fiscal position. The US government debt is already about 100% of GDP. In New Zealand, it's about a quarter of that. Uh, even less if you take the super fund into account. Uh, they've got a demographic time bomb, same as most Western nations, and um, and Trump's going on a spending spree if, if he's to be believed, and that is probably one of the policies that you are more likely to believe. I've heard today that some of his other policies are quietly disappearing off his website, but that one's not. So um, I think that's going to be the, an issue because more um, treasuries, US bond, government bonds on issue, means the price of them is going down and the inverse of a bond price is the interest rate. That means in interest rates are going up and we've seen that happen in the US and the New Zealand and Australian bond markets are very highly correlated with the US market because money can choose where it goes and as the Minister mentioned New Zealand's been a pretty popular destination for that money but we've seen our bond rates rise very very sharply um, and, and 10 year rates are, are now well off their lows in August, um, almost around a percent higher than they were. That's a pretty hefty move and it does underline the fact that mortgage rates are not going lower even though the Reserve Bank cut the OCR this week, uh, bond rates and swap rates, those wholesale rates that underlie retail rates have moved higher and funding costs have gone higher on top of that as well. 
Um, so globally we've had seven years of highly experimental monetary policy. They've really pushed the limits here. They have cut interest rates to zero and then they've started buying bonds and other assets to push the interest rates lower still. But just in the last six months or so people have started to realise maybe the costs of that policy might outweigh the benefits for, for a few reasons. Firstly, savers have been absolutely shafted in, in, around the world at a time when you've got ageing populations. So you've got lots of people aged 50 plus who are in panic mode desperately cutting back their spending, which is the exact opposite of what the central banks are trying to achieve. So yes, you encourage young people to borrow more, um, and that boosts spending, but that debt has to be paid back at some point. And the older people are saving like mad because they're now getting half a percent on their savings rate rather than three or four or in New Zealand, three or four rather than five or six. And so, um, so that's actually not been helpful. It's been really bad for income inequality because it's boosted asset prices, equities, houses, collector cars, you, know, you name it. Any asset you can buy, borrow money to buy has been boosted, artificially boosted in value by the incredibly low interest rates, which is a lot of fun on the way up. Um, but a couple of problems, firstly, it's above fundamentally justified values and it might not go down quite as, as smoothly as it went up. Um, and secondly, it's been very bad for income inequality because um, we've had very low inflation and low wage growth, but asset prices have gone up and of course it's not the, uh, the poor people who hold the assets. So that income inequality is one of the drivers behind Brexit and the rise of populist politicians around the globe. And it's, it's happening here too with a lot of people being locked out of the housing market, particularly in Auckland. So a few issues. Um, so now markets have been reassessing whether central banks are going to continue put with their foot to the floor or whether they're going to back off a bit. Um, and the idea that they might stop buying all of these bonds has seen the price of those bonds start to fall or the interest rates start to rise. And of course, it's, it, like many things in finance and economics, once it gets ahead of steam up, it can rapidly become self-fulfilling. So we're, we're not expecting that those interest rates will go through the roof, but it, they might. And if they do, then um, central banks can ease all they like. Um, the price of borrowing is only going up. So uh, commodity prices are a bit all over the place. Growth has been pretty sputtering in most places, uh, not New Zealand. We've had a pretty good run. Asset prices are looking a little toppy. Uh, certainly they're looking a little more volatile. Politics is very interesting. It's where it's at. It's going, going to be all about uh, politics and, and fiscal policy going forward because monetary policy is tapped out. Um, and we've got a, a lot of elections coming up in Europe. France, Italy, for starters, um, and populists are going to take huge heart from what happened in the US. Um, so that could be a really interesting time as well. Uh, credit markets, a little bit fragile. We've had a long period where people haven't worried too much about risk uh, because they haven't needed to because interest rates have been so low. But of course, not worrying about risk was what led to the subprime crisis. So it's, it's a slightly dubious behaviour to deliberately encourage. Um, and, and But who knows, those, those, those sorts of things come out uh, in the wash. So is this the perfect time for a second Fed hike? Well, that's quite interesting because the pricing of whether the Federal Reserve, that's their Reserve Bank in the US, was going to raise rates next month, as they've pretty much said they expect to do, went from about 70% down to about 5% and then back up to now over 80%, all in about 36 hours, um, as the market digested Trump. Firstly, they said, oh, goodness, markets are tanking, there's no way they're going to hike. And then they said, Trump's going to spend and that's going to be inflationary. Um, it's so ironic, for seven years of trying desperately to get inflation off the floor and all they needed to do was elect Trump. Now the uh, inflation expectations that are built into bond markets have gone soaring upwards. So that's that problem solved. Excellent. Um, so it's, uh, so they're now they're saying the Fed's going to need to hike more rapidly. But the question is how things like equities are going to cope with that when they've been fed this morphine for seven years. What happens when, the, when the, they turn the tap off? Um, it, it's certainly a risk of much higher volatility. So I'm um, pretty much out of time, but just a couple of charts. That uh, Federal Reserve, that's their OCR equivalent, the Fed funds rate versus their economy. You can see there um, they desperately needed negative 4% interest rates during the GFC, obviously couldn't do that. They started printing money. But they've just held rates at pretty much zero, even as the economy's recovered, deliberately trying to get too much of a head of steam, uh, more than, uh, than uh, usual head of steam up to get inflation up, because no one wants to turn into Japan with entrenched deflation, very hard to uh, get out of deflation, whereas we know how to beat inflation, we did it um, in, the, in the 80s with you know, Don, we'll, we'll like Don Brush again, 
Paul Volcker in the US, I'm sure they'd be delighted to come back. Well, actually, I'm not sure Paul Volcker's still alive, but Don Brash is certainly still around. He could do the job for us if inflation got away, but deflation is much harder to deal with because you can only cut your interest rates to around zero and then your real interest rates are still positive. Your real wages are ratcheting up because people don't like wage, nominal wage cuts, uh, that sort of thing. It's very, that can be quite a problem for an economy. So, um, so they've deliberately done this on purpose, but as I said, it's had some unexpected results. So their bond yields have moved up further since I did that chart. So a bit of a ski jump going on. Um, if you took it back further, that, that's been a long, long, long-term decline. So that increase is not um, sizable as yet uh, in terms of the level, but it's certainly a very interesting change in trend. Um, so perhaps the, the par bond party is over. Especially when you're around zero, even a small increase in interest rates represents a massive price drop for bonds. It represents huge losses for people who are in bond funds. It represents massive losses for people who have bought 30, 50, 70 year bonds at yields of under 2%. I mean, you don't need much inflation to wipe you out in that scenario. So bonds are um, possibly more dangerous than equities at the moment. But people, because people think they're a safe haven, they think you only lose money in bonds if people don't pay you back at the end of it. But no, that's not how it works. Global commodity prices are a bit all over the place. They've also had a pretty volatile time in the last 24 hours or 48 hours. I expect they'll continue to do so. It'll be interesting to see what happens at the next dairy auction. Uh, Fonterra's cut the supply again for that, so we may see an increase again. It's gone pretty much vertical in the last auction, long may it last, but it is based on um, an assumption that New Zealand supply is going to be curtailed and all we need is a bit of sunshine in Hamilton and, and our supply is going to take off again. So um, we'll wait and see there. So there is the global equity markets. As you can see, um, the most interesting one there is New Zealand. That's the one at the top. We've had a massive outperformance this year. And right up until September, we were thinking we were bulletproof. Every time global markets had a lurch, we had a small hiccup. Um, but now, when the global markets have a hiccup, we're having a lurch. It's switched from about the start of September. Um, so, so that's notable. Um, only the Nikkei really did worse over the last 36 hours. Our share market dropped 3.6. Uh, then, of course, it all bounced back again. Um, I can't remember exactly when I did this. It was impossible to keep this chart updated. It was moving around so fast. Um, but that's a the pretty massive drop from the peak there. We're down 10% uh, or thereabouts, uh, which is a correction. Um, but you can, you can see there, we've been certainly flavour of the month. What's perhaps most interesting is that the foreign share of the, our share market's gone from 25 to 50%. Um, over only about four years. So um, that's, that's foreigners' money. We have been top of the pops, which is wonderful. Uh, it's the same in the bond market as well. That means the government can borrow cheaper than they could before, um, but it does make us vulnerable if all that money should decide to leave in a hurry. That means we've got an extra vulnerability. So a bit of a double-edged sword there. Um, global inflation has been missing in action. It might be coming back. The Chinese producer price index is no longer falling. This is quite a shock. It's been falling since 2012. We've gotten so used to things getting ever cheaper, but the anecdotes coming out of China are suggesting that those days might be past. Um, so that would be really interesting for central banks if inflation took off but growth doesn't. Then what are they going to do? That's, uh, that would be messy. Um, and you can see that the chart on the right is how inflation is coming out relative to expectations, what economists think, expect it to be. So it's been surprisingly low for the last four years. Now it's tending to come out about as expected. If that starts going positive, inflation starts surprising on the upside. Carnage in the bond markets, I think, is the, is the upshot of that, as central banks would need to scramble to catch up. Whoops. And finally, um, <coughs> That's just the volatility of markets. You can see the red line there. Although it's been quite exciting the last 24 hours, it's actually still nothing like the GFC or the European sovereign debt crisis or even what happened last year when the Chinese uh, devalued their currency by 5% in one hit and everyone decided it was going 30 and had a, a panic. The, the Chinese currency is now much, much lower than it was then, but they've done it um, gradually and not scared the horses. They learned from that experience. Um, but the other interesting thing about this chart is if it is going to blow up, it tends to do it in the second half of the year, um, for whatever reason, in the, in the Euro northern hemisphere summer. Um, but there are a lot of years that aren't charted there where nothing happened. So don't, don't feel this is a foregone conclusion that volatility is going to rise, but um, it, was, it is a riskier time of year. So finally, important notice. No, I'm not really going to read that. Um, 
global asset prices are artificially inflated and therefore vulnerable. That is just what's happened. Central banks have painted themselves into a corner and it's, uh, the risk is that they won't be able to make an elegant exit. Um, I hope they do, but it's pretty difficult to envisage that scenario, to be honest. Uh, politics is the new black. Politics is what we all need to care about now and it's uh, unpredictable, very unpredictable at the moment. So um, that will be pushing markets around. A global monetary policy has done its dash, might have overdone its dash, to be honest. Um, it's probably done more harm than good in the last few years. Uh, fiscal policy has limited headroom in most countries. In New Zealand, we're lucky that if, if we had uh, GFC2, we could throw money at infrastructure projects like Trump is intending to do, but we could actually afford it. That's the difference. <laughs> Commodity prices are vulnerable. Um, global trade is now vulnerable from politics as much as anything else, emerging Asia and China. Um, Markets so far appear to be differentiating. Our New Zealand dollar hardly moved when it, all the markets were crashing, and that, although our equity market did. And that's a sign that markets are differentiating and still seeing New Zealand as a bit of a safe haven, um, which is uh, really helpful. Um, but we are a small open economy. We won't be immune if Asia takes a big hit from, say, a trade war. But on the other hand, there might be opportunities for us. If China and, and US go to have a trade war but we stay out of it, then there might be some windows open up that wouldn't have been there otherwise. So on net it'll be bad, but then there would, would be offsets. Um, so yeah, watch China. Their, their policy mix uh, is, has been all over the place. There's no question the mix of their growth has deteriorated to become more and more debt driven. They've got a huge debt problem. Um, they're going to have to deal with it at some point, but every time they have a growth hiccup, they just they reverse course and pile on more debt. Uh, but they're running out of road in that regard. Um, so volatile times ahead, um, but I'm not going to make any more predictions than that. Volatility is a given, but don't ask me about the direction. <laughs> so I'm um, out of time, so I will stop there. But thank you. Thanks.